Clarence Kelly, Henry Demarest Lloyd, Jane Adams, John Peter Alkeld, Louise DeCoven Bowen, Carol Wright. The believers, they couldn't be stopped and they couldn't be intimidated. They were smart enough to survive. They knew their adversaries and outmaneuvered them. These six were people who saw some wrongs and did something about them. They just kept believing when others said nothing could be done. Just like now, how did I find them? As a lawyer, a legal researcher, and always a writer, I came to Chicago and fell in love with Chicago history, especially the history of the 1890s, and I found all six of them here working together then. And they found me. They were all writers. They wrote books, letters, and speeches, and left records of themselves and the places they went. There were journals and diaries, and some, mostly the newspapers, took pictures. Of course, they couldn't do everything they wanted to do, nor can we, but they did a lot. They made institutions which lived on long after they were no longer present. These six held the law accountable, realized that the law was there to hold society together while making things better. The law was not just to protect the owners of everything. What they accomplished could never have been accomplished by any one of them or any two of them, although each was remarkable. Florence Kelly, the first Illinois factory inspector, the first woman appointed to a statewide office in the country, a mother, a daughter, a teacher, a writer, a lawmaker, mentor to Frances Perkins, the first woman cabinet officer, came to Chicago in 1891, fleeing an abusive husband with three children in tow, because Chicago was where it was happening, for women, for labor, for reform, and a woman with three toddlers could hide out here, could get a divorce here. Became a lawyer, graduated from Northwestern Law School in 1895, fought to get other people's children out of the factories, especially the sweatshops, where the 10-year-olds were tied to the sewing machines, and out of the glass factories, where seven-year-old barefoot orphans, the blower's dogs, ran over molten glass carrying water in caverns so hot, the unionized glass blowers wouldn't stay there. The orphan boys had no choice. They had been sold. Oh, the factory owners, the manufacturers said, if we have to pay the children more, we can't make a living, we will shut down. They didn't. They did fine, including many whose families are still here, whose names we recognize. Florence Kelly, fearless, inspiring. She was already well known when she came to Chicago and became a leader here. Someone who believed the helpless children deserved a chance. Less than half of the children born in Chicago survived till age five at that time. Henry Demarest Lloyd, journalist, poet, advocate, spellbinding writer. When Florence Kelly took him to the slums of Chicago and he saw the conditions of the women and children in the factories and tenements, he sat down on the curb and wept. Graduated from Columbia Law School in a hurry, couldn't wait to get out and right some wrongs, which he did. Came to Chicago, more opportunities here for a firebrand lawyer. When his father-in-law, the owner of the Tribune, found that Henry Demarest Lloyd wrote a column in the Tribune supporting the Haymarket defendants, he disinherited his daughter and saw that the respected and popular economic commentator was fired. Henry Demarest Lloyd and his brilliant wife, Jessie, moved to Winneka and with their children then because it was cheaper to live there. Florence Kelly arrived in Chicago with no money, no place to live, and three children under seven. She was put in touch with Henry Demarest Lloyd through a friend of a friend of his sister. And he said, just like that, we'll take the children. And Florence Kelly's three children lived with Henry Demarest Lloyd and his family 
for years. Florence Kelly went to live at Hull House, taking the streetcar to Winnetka on weekends to see her children to do the work she was meant to do. For months, during the raging smallpox epidemic in Chicago when Florence Kelly and others fought to make the lazy, politically bought, incompetent city health inspector do his job or be fired, he wasn't fired, she didn't see her children for fear of infecting everyone. Jane Addams, Gentle Jane, another great writer, a Chicago legend, so much more than a tollway. <laughs> With her life partner, built one of the first settlement houses on the edge of the slums and was the spirit, the heart of Hull House. Hull House was home, not just for Florence Kelly, but for those working alongside where the poor lived, documenting everything about what was going on in the factories and how people lived and died in those slums and providing a refuge. Jane Addams said, don't seek to do good, but to understand life. With, with others, these women invented social science research and social work and lived their principles, making Hull House a place of hope, education, warmth, light, and food, open to all, all of the poor, of every language, but mostly for the immigrants who came to Chicago with nothing by the tens of thousands, and especially for the women who did the worst work, but not only for the women. John Peter Altgeld, gimpy, with a limp and a hair lip, so short, so unprepossessing that the father of the woman he loved declared him unworthy. And so he tramped across the country, working on the railroads and farms as a day laborer. Everyone he had ever worked for said he was the best worker they ever had. Nearly dying more than once, survived, came to Chicago with his bride, the same whose disapproving father had now died, became an unlikely politician, was elected governor, and appointed as factory inspector Florence Kelly whom he met at one of Henry Demarest Lloyd's regular Sunday afternoon dinners. John Peter Alkeld first offered the job of factory inspector to Henry Demarest Lloyd, who said, you should appoint Florence Kelly, and so he did. He built the University of Illinois from an agricultural college to a university, got the factory inspection law through a reluctant legislature, signed it, and helped make it more than a piece of paper. Louise de Coven Bowen. Her great-grandmother rode in a covered wagon to Chicago with a shotgun on her lap. The grandfather went on to make a fortune, the Chicago way by buying and selling real estate. As an heiress and a beauty, she was the catch of Chicago and married a man as generous and kind as she was. As treasurer, she bankrolled Hull House for decades without fanfare. When Jane Addams was sick and dying, Louise de Coven Bowen brought her home and took care of her. Carol Wright an unsung hero who just saw what was needed and got the job done. Way was a maps and statistics person, appointed supervisor of the Massachusetts Census and then of the 11th U.S. Census, devised a, me a measure for measuring unemployment, which is still used today, never wanted any praise or attention for himself, volunteered for the Union Army from New Hampshire as part of his town's quota for the state, was elected head of that small band, and ended up as an adjunct to General Sherman. The courts and the criminal justice system, still a mess. What are those women doing? Is it a baptism? This is not orange, is the new black but it is women in prison. Carol Wright persuaded a recalcitrant Congress to fund the slums of the great city's project, 
which despite being cut, postponed, and shunted aside, was the engine for the data collection maps project, which became Hull House Maps and Papers, the still mesmerizing book by Florence Kelly, the four anonymous government schedule men from Washington, and the residents of Hull House. They went to each house, tenement, and room in the designated area of the slums and recorded who lived there, their ethnicity, language, and their weekly wages. This is the bottom of the Great Depression of 1893, when 100,000 homeless men lived on the streets of Chicago. The white spots, whorehouses, and illegal gambling resorts where government inspectors didn't dare to enter. Chicago, that great and ruthless economic engine that it was in the 1890s and still is, the hustle and bustle and vulgarity, the high and low culture that is still ours and that we still love, and the laws. For good to be done through law, there was the city council, the state legislature, the courts, and the U.S. Congress. Florence Kelly and her pals, the residents of Hull House, marched onto the floor of the Illinois State Legislature and filled the visitors' galleries demanding that the right thing be done, pass the factory inspection statute. And they did, in spite of all the powerful manufacturing interests against it. These women didn't even have the vote. In and out of the courts, the factory inspection statute went challenged by the manufacturers who hated Florence Kelly and everything she and her friends and the new law stood for. Got it overturned, then it was resuscitated elsewhere so that Louis Brandeis could be persuaded to persuade the United States Supreme Court to uphold its principles. Always the imperative to protect the children to give children a chance, a primordial, irrepressible, human instinct, an animal instinct. If it is all over for the adults, at least help the children. Get them out of it, whatever the out of it means. The hellish button factory, the drunken household, the glassworks with its treacherous floors and stifling heat. The person who could read, read to the ones who couldn't, until they learned how to. The clothes, sweeping long skirts, thick wool coats, and everyone always wore a hat. <laughs> long cotton underwear and shirtwaists and shirts, for which the hundreds of laundries with their cheap services were a necessity. The laundries where tens of thousands worked in all the cities, in London and Paris and Shanghai, the laundries and the public houses were centers for speech and public organizing because they had the free lunch until it was banned in Chicago. What were these people doing? Everyone was always working, even those who didn't have to. Some were trying to make it better. Always, all of these six were avid readers, devouring everything in print, writing books, pamphlets, and newspapers, writing for newspapers, writing about it all, thinking about it, and going to public talks, like this one, to learn what was going on around them, to listen. They would say, and I would say, read books, write books, find books, find the people doing things and who they are give books, especially to children. These people are us, Florence Kelly, Henry Demarest Lloyd, Jane Addams, John Peter Altgeld, Louise de Coven Bowen, Carol Wright. Fall in love with history. Let it live in your imagination. This is who we are. Thank you. <laughs>